Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending where you are, okay? Fortunately, we have friends around the world, so we are so fortunate. Okay, welcome to our first fixed webinar, okay? This is our first one. I'm gonna present myself. I'm Carlos Fontan, I'm the marketing manager here in BB6. So we started this journey of uh, broadcasting webinars in order to, first of all, providing you value, okay? The value that, that we really want to provide you. Every time we talk with you, we support you, like uh, with our, all of our distributors. And also, we want to be near to you during this, this, this pandemic crisis, okay? This crisis. So, I want to highlight that we don't, we don't want you to waste your time, okay? Nowadays, we are uh, running out of time and we don't want to fulfill internet with nonsense information. We want to provide you information. This is important for us, okay? Thank you for coming. So today, you know, we are presenting the topic, uh, water microbiology. Uh, we are gonna talk about the water importance its um, impact in animal health. Also, we are gonna uh, ana uh, do analyze interpretation, interpretation, and also we will discuss about biofilm, okay? So, I'm gonna present my colleague, okay? He's Luis Granado, I'm gonna let you get in. He is a um, poultry specialist, he is a vet sergeant, poultry specialist, is a nutrition specialist I am biology specialist okay he's in charge of uh, America Africa and some Middle East um, distributors you most of you know him so I'm going to present him thank you very much Carlos uh, I think you will have to open the camera for me yeah and allowing it yeah. to you Okay, here you have. There this. we go. All right. So thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you everyone for your time to attend this, this first webinar that we are doing uh, in FIX. Um, and as Carlos just said, we don't want to make you waste your time. So basically, we are preparing these webinars uh, with, with very useful tips. Uh, we want to give you useful information that you can use on, on a daily basis. Uh, and we hope you like them. Uh, we hope your feedback as well, and, and we're gonna start. Uh, so let me share this. All right. Okay, can you see it? Carlos, you will have to tell me. Okay, I see. Right, so so we are going to talk, as Carlos said, about water microbiology, right? Uh, I would like to clearly define the scope of this talk. First, we want to we want to create awareness of the importance of the water in our production. We have seen through years, as you know, that uh, the company SIX has got many years of experience, how normally people forget about the water, which is the main intake to our farm. This is a common mistake, obviously, and it implies a big hazard for our biosecurity program. Second one, uh, we want to make sure that everyone is realizing how through the water with an appropriate treatment to get an optimal quality, we will improve the general and intestinal health of our animals with the related benefits that that one has. And the third one, and related to the previous one, how with a good water quality, we will see a reduction on other kinds of treatments, especially of antibiotics. You know that the legislation in Europe is getting uh, more and more strict against the use of antibiotics in farming. And we have seen how this trend is spreading all over the world. So achieving a good quality of water, especially in terms of microbiology is going to be the best tool for us. 
So <clears throat> let's talk quickly about some basic concepts uh, for water. Normally water supposes from two to three times the amount of feed that an animal has. So you can imagine uh, how important the water is and, and how important then is to have a good quality uh, in our water. Uh, talking about birds, uh, they will always drink and then eat. So first they drink, then they will, once they have the water, they will go eating. So it is very important that they have a good quality one uh, for them eating. As we said before, uh, water is normally forgotten by farmers. And this happens because a lot of times we cannot see with our eyes the effect of a poor quality in our water. We have to make clear the difference between a clinical or acute condition and subclinical condition. Obviously, we will be able to see an acute or clinical condition, and then uh, we will have the chance to spend time and money on treatment. But with the subclinical conditions, which mostly will happen undetected, uh, we probably won't have the chance to do much because obviously we are not seeing it. And they normally will be worsening the conditions and the production rates from, from our farms. This is why is us, the veterinarians, the ones that have to assess the water quality, obviously considering that not every species or ages will have the same requirements. For example, uh, younger animals or stages of production where, where animals are more stressed will require a better microbiological quality. But this is something that we always remark because we, we don't have to go mad. Some people, when they are talking about uh, the, the microbiology of, of the water and when we do our water analysis, they go mad because they always want the zero. They want uh, nothing on the water. This is very important. We always talk that uh, the main thing is it's not it's not to get a zero in absolutely everything. The main thing is to get an optimal quality and to decrease the microbiological challenge to a proper level. Because we have to bear in mind that a certain level of challenge is always going to be good to develop the immune system in, in our animals, right? So uh, to finish with the, these basic concepts, uh, just as an introduction, just to mention how the water can be a source of different uh, diseases uh, from different origins, sorry, uh, like bacterial, virus, parasitical, but also chemical. Uh, but we will be focusing this time on, on microbiology, right? So actually there is no legislation at all that stages the microbiological parameters for water for animals. So basically what we have been doing through years is uh, following the indicators stated for water for human consumption. Uh, you can see the, the European legislation right there. And these are the ones that we are following when we, we are doing a water analysis. We, we are basically checking these ones because, because they are easy to find. And by knowing these five parameters, they, they can provide us with a good information on what's going on in, in our water. And we will, we will be explaining how to interpret these ones right now. So let's start with the first one, which is the aerobic mesophilic, mesophilic or the colony count at 22 degrees, as we saw on the, other, on the previous one. So these are, uh, as I said, they, they will always provide with, with a really good information about, in this case, about the contamination that, that we have. We have to bear in mind that these ones are not non-pathological, but they provide with a really good information on just the general uh, environmental contamination. These ones are basically everywhere. They are on the dust, they are, they are everywhere. So if we find them in, in our water analysis, for sure, we can tell that we have open deposits or we have open conductions of water. And having a high level of these ones will indicate a poor water management in our farm, right? 
as I said, they are non-pathological, but we know that if we have an open deposit, if we have deposit, if we have an open, uh, let's say, uh, conduction, we have to bear in mind that uh, there is access to, to our water, right? So there could be more hazards coming in the water. Uh, we have to bear always that in mind. These ones, uh, the ones that you can see now, the total coliforms, E. coli, and Therococcus, are, may, are going to, to mainly show the fecal contamination. And we could even know if this contamination comes from animal or human origin, right? The total coliform includes the enterobacteria group. Uh, many of them are not pathological, but if there is a big number, uh, we can create problems. Uh, so we have to, to be careful with these ones. Also with, with E. coli, we all know the, the problem. Uh, with E. coli, we will talk about uh, different ones later on. But we have to bear in mind that the presence of E. coli is associated with the presence of Salmonella, uh, both enteritidis and Tifimurium. Also, if we find E. coli in our water, we, we can think about the presence of protozoans. And then we have the Enterococcus, with, which indicates uh, all fecal contamination. But we have to bear in mind that Enterococcus is probably the best fecal uh, indicator. If we have Enterococcus, uh, somewhere we can tell that there is, uh, there is fecal material in contact with, with our water. Uh, so, as I said before, uh, we can know if the contamination comes from human or animal origin. And this is because the fecal coliforms are much more common in human feces than enterococcus. And the opposite is happening in animals, where enterococcus are much more common than fecal coliforms. So, if after getting the results from an analysis, we calculate the proportion fecal coliforms divided by enterococcus, and this proportion is smaller than one, we can think that the contamination comes from animal, but if this number is bigger than one, we can state then that the contamination comes from, from human origin, right? And the last one that uh, we get in the water analysis is the Clostridium. Uh, is commonly checked in, in all of the analysis. Uh, basically, this one has got a fecal origin as well, but uh, we normally don't use it as a fecal marker like the previous ones. What happens with Clostridium? Clostridium, as you know, it belongs to the normal uh, microbiota on the digestive system in our animals and is not pathological itself. Uh, the problem is when we have a huge number of feet and then we can have the problem. And the problem with Clostridium, uh, you know, in, in birds, for instance, it causes the necrotic enteritis. Uh, but also in any other kind of animals, we, we can get a, a big problem because normally it affects the, the best animals. And suddenly we can find them dead or bloated. Uh, so it can, it can have a huge economical impact, right? Uh, when, basically, when the balance is broken uh, in the number of, of Clostridium is when we, when we have the problem. We have an excess of this bacteria. Uh, and we have to bear in mind that this is very important. Uh, that oxygen is the main enemy of Clostridium. And this is basically to bear in mind because a lot of people are still treating the water with chlorine or other kind of products which are not very effective against Clostridium. Uh, we have to, to, as I said, we have to always think about this one like uh, having a huge economical impact because it will affect the best animals that we have, right? So I will, that, that was finishing with the five ones that we are checking on the, on the water analysis. And now I have, I want to, to quickly talk about some of, of the disease itself, right? Uh, because 
the necrotic enteritis, enteritis, sorry, uh, is a worldwide disease caused by clostridium in, in our birth. Uh, when the excessive proliferation happens, as I said, uh, they are going to start releasing a lot of toxins and they will be causing the, the problem. It has a, a huge negative effect in, in our production, in all the production rates and a huge economical impact. As I said, it resists, resists very well the chlorine treatments. Uh, in the clinical stage, obviously, we will see a high mortality. But on the subclinical stage, uh, that we might not realize, we will see we will have a poor health conditions in our birds. Uh, the whole digestive process will be affected because obviously the animals uh, won't be on a state to, to have a an optimum digestive process. And subsequently, all the production rates will be decreased as well. It affects broilers uh, and mainly, mainly, but it's associated as well with, with co coccidia on, on hands, right? Another one that I would like to talk uh, is salmonellosis. Uh, is associated, as we said before, when we were talking about the fecal markers with, with fecal contamination. And it's not a, a bacteria that normally likes the water, but it uses the water as a vector, right? Uh, it can come from feces from rats and birds. And again, it has got a huge economical impact. Uh, and special attention because this one can be transmitted from, from animals to humans. Uh, if we find enterococcus on our analysis, uh, as I said before, we have to start thinking about salmonella. Normally everyone thinks about uh, rats and birds eating on the stores where the feed is, uh, is a store spreading the bacteria, but we have seen it uh, spread it through the water as well. Uh, as I said, it can work as a vector, right? Again, on a clinical stage, we will find a, a poor quality in our birds, a decreased efficiency on the digestive process. And the same we would find on a subclinical stage, the whole digestive process will, will not be as optimal as it should be. So all the production rates will be decreased. This one, it affects all kinds of poultry and it supposes a severe loss of profits, right? So other, other bacteria as well, which we will mention uh, because they have been seen to be important in relation to water are Pseudomona, Campylobacter and Bordetella. Not as common as the previous one, but growing more and more every day and transmitted through water, right? So Pseudomona is very important, especially in incubators and hatcheries because it can affect uh, and infect the eggs. This bacteria likes living in the water and can be very difficult to remove from the environment, right? It, provide, it gives a, a high mortality in newborn chicks and embryos. Campylobacter as well has a huge affinity to live in the water is not as important for the birds itself as no major issues are caused to them, but it has got a special interest as it is one of the major causes of diarrhea caused by food, by food in, in humans nowadays, right? Uh, it colonizes the broiler intestine, so it is released everywhere. And as, we, as I said, it, uh, it causes a lot of, of uh, cases in, in humans. Ambor de Tela avium has got a high affinity for water as well. And once entered, it also spreads through the air in the farm. Uh, it's highly contagious as most uh, respi respiratory pathogens. We will not ha have a high mortality, uh, but a strong respiratory symptom symptomatology and a severe reduced appetite resulting as well in a poor production rate. So, all of these bacteria are going to affect 
uh, our production rates at the end of the day. Uh, with this one, uh, I'm finishing with bacteria, but uh, I would also like to, to quickly talk about protozoals because they are important. They are highly resistant as well as we said with Clostridium to, to any chlorine treatments. They can present difference in somatology, such as neurological or digestive, but they are very important because they can carry other microorganisms with them. So they can carry virus, they can carry bacteria like the ones we just spoke, E. coli, Salmonella, uh, Campylobacter, and they could even carry any other protozoals, right? Other parasites that can be transmitted through the water are protozoals like oxidia or worms, especially nematode eggs like a strong keloid sabium and flatworms. All of them are going to result in a clinical or subclinical digestive symptomatology with a repercussion on the production rates. The digestive process, as we just said, will be affected being less, less effective. And for last, uh, cyanobacteria are really important, uh, especially in open water storages, as the sunlight will make them grow. They can be found, uh, they can be found for other bacteria, providing protection and nutrition. Uh, they will modify the water conditions, making it more likely for other microorganisms. But the main issue with them uh, is the production of toxins. They have a huge uh, capacity to produce toxins. Uh, and that's where we will have the main problem because uh, our water will be contaminated with a uh, high level of toxins. That will affect the general health uh, of our animals and it's quite likely to cause the death. Uh, so they are they are kind of dangerous. Uh, so with this, uh, I am finishing with the microorganisms that we have found to be more important for, for, for our animals in relation with the water. But uh, I will I will have a, a few minutes as well to talk to you about biofilm, biofilm right? Um, it's another aspect which is, uh, is highly related to, to the microbiological quality. I won't, I won't do a deep uh, speech on this because uh, another day in another webinar, we will be talking exclusively about uh, biofilm. But I consider it's, it's important now after knowing all these uh, concepts of microbiology in the water to, to have a quick chat about it, right? So what is the biofilm? We, we define the biofilm simply as a microbiological population covering a surface, but itself is quite a more complex, complex structure, right? So this is something we have to, to ask ourselves. So how many times uh, have we paid attention to the inside of our water systems? This is something, this is an issue that we have uh, I've seen to be much more common than what anyone could expect because people normally don't, as long as they have the water and they provide water to the animals, they don't pay much attention to what is in there. And that's where the problem comes. The main component in the biofilm is the organic carbon creating a mucopolysaccharide layer, right? It will create aggregates more or less continuous and variable in thickness, which are very difficult to detach. So basically, uh, what it will happen is uh, it will happen a, a very irregular surface, which makes it easier for all the microorganisms to establish and to grow there. We will find in, in the biofilm a balance between bacteria, yeast, algae, and nutrients once the whole thing is formed. So it is very important to bear in mind that absolutely any bacteria can create this biofilm. 
that's another aspect aspect of the importance of a good microbiological quality in our water. Uh, basically, at the end of the day, it can create a, a whole resistant structure because uh, they can even develop uh, activity to inact inactivate these infectants, right? And also the outside layer can, can work as a physical barrier for the bacteria which are in the inside. So uh, you can see the picture on the right. This is uh, obviously a picture taken by, by us. Uh, sorry. And this is, is very common. We find this uh, not on a daily basis, but it, this is this is very common. And obviously, as you can imagine, that is not good to have in our pipes because all the water flowing through that uh, thing is going to be drink by our animals, right? Um, as you can imagine by, by the look of it, we are going to find two types of metabolisms there. So we will find the aerobic one on the outside, on the part which is in contact with the water, uh, slower, obviously. And then we will have, we will find an anaerobic uh, metabolism faster in the inside. We, th this is important because uh, we were talking before about certain bacteria like Clostridium, uh, which is anaerobic. So that's a, a very good place for Clostridium to, to be and to grow and to contaminate our, our water, right? The whole layer, the mucopolysaccharide layer provides with protection and nutrients uh, for, for the bacteria. And uh, these bacteria there are going to be producing endotoxins and they will be contaminating the water constantly, right? And in regards of, of forming this, this biofilm is very important as we said, the, the microbiology in our water, but also the, the presence of any organic material uh, will be very important, but we have to bear in mind that there are some predisposing factors, different ones, uh, as we can see on this one. For, for example, we just said organic material, inorganic material as well, calcium mag mag and magnesium will, will be depositing inside of the pipes, will be uh, creating this irregular surface as well, and that will make it easier for the bacteria to, to grow there. Also, iron, sulfurs uh, are very good for certain bacteria like Clostridium to, to grow. Uh, it's very important as well, we talked about that before the sunlight, uh, when we were talking about the cyanobacteria, because they, they, will, uh, they will make algae to, to grow, right? Uh, if we have algae, we have, it's much more likely to have uh, biofilm. Also, the water temperature, as you can imagine, if, uh, if we have a warm temperature, if we have a pipe where the sunlight is, is constantly heating and warming the water, that will be better for the bacteria as well. They will be, uh, they will be happier there, they will be growing easy, and we will have a problem. The water flow is important as well. Uh, if we have a slow speed in, our, in the water flow, this is something that could happen when, for instance, we have uh, just very young chicks which arrive to the farm. Uh, so they are not drinking a huge amount of water. We have a slow speed. In that slow speed, is more likely as, as well to, to happen the biofilm because the, the bacteria will be feeling more comfortable there. So the, it will be easier for them to, to just grow. It's very important within our biosecurity plan to, to clean the water system, the deposits. Uh, so obviously if we don't have a proper cleaning uh, and disinfection of the whole uh, thing, it will be more likely to happen. Uh, the kind of, of pipe, the kind of surface, obviously flat surfaces, surfaces are better. Uh, if we have some sort of pipes uh, which are not as flat that will that will be better for the bacteria to establish there as well. 
and any other products used in the water, like any excipients, sugars, antibiotics, uh, vitamins, amino acids, even organic acidifiers, we have to bear in mind that they provide energy to the microorganisms. And we have to be careful when we are using uh, these products not to have the, the biofilm, right? And what consequences we will have? Uh, so basically, uh, the consequences that we will see in our farms, we will have basically are the ones that we will see but we have to pay special attention to the ones that we don't see because they will be happening much earlier than the other ones. Uh, that's why uh, working on prevention should be our goal. So basically something that we will see will be blocked block nipple drinkers, leaking drinkers, and even a whole mucus substance coming out from the drinkers. But we have to be very careful with, with what we don't see, which is a decreased water flow, a smell uh, or a flavor in the water. Uh, we might not notice, but obviously our, our animals, if they, if they feel like a strange smell or a flavor in the water, they will, they will stop drinking. Obviously, as we said before, they need to drink in order to eat. So we will have a problem there. Uh, even certain of products because chemical reactions might happen within the biofilm. Uh, protection, the protected microorganisms that will be uh, inside of the biofilm. And even some malfunction of vaccinations, probiotics and disinfectants. Uh, but at the end of the, of, the, of the line, we will have a contaminated water, even though we might be treating our water uh, but we have a problem with these pipes, so all the bacteria are, and the toxins are coming back to the water. Uh, and as I said, uh, working on prevention should be our goal. So for last, don't ever, you don't have to forget about biofilm, always bear it in mind. Be aware that it can only take 24 hours to be created uh and pay special attention to all the deposits and pipes especially the pipes and remember that as i said the success is working on prevention treating on a daily basis and don't let it grow uh so basically uh this was uh the quick chat that i wanted to do with you about the the biofilm uh the what, what I was explaining, the, the best option with this, obviously, is to treat it absolutely every day. Uh, you all know about uh, the way we are dealing with waters. We have Aquasix. Uh, it's our, our main product for, for water. And it provides, uh, we are not talking now about all the benefits coming from, from the digestive health, but it is going to help first with the microbiological quality of the water, uh, bearing in mind that it's a highly efficient product, but it's going to help as well with removing the, the biofilm and removing the lime scale, right? So that's, uh, that's for us the best option to, to deal with this problem. Um, so this is it for me, by me. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for your time and, and your attention to this.